Thank you and hi, welcome. Um, I'm Asaf and this is Building Lighting Fast Apps with Async.io. Today, I want to tell you a story. A story of how we had a problem in production at the worst possible time, of course. Um, how we had to solve that problem with designing a new app. Uh, spoiler, it's going to include Async.io. Then, how that solution found itself uh, in production, how it uh, integrated with the existing architecture. And lastly, we're going to talk about some learnings we had um, from that experience, that adventure. Uh, first, a few words about myself. My name is Asaf. I work at Dropbox. Uh, I used to work at PayPal, Ericsson, some other companies you haven't heard of, um, like ap apart from these. <laughs> Um, mainly worked on distributed system systems at scale, and um, you'll see why I really, really like AsyncIO. Uh, so back to the to the story. Um, first, the problem: Why did we um, have to redesign a component? Well, to, to understand the issue, we have to understand the system. This was an event-based system uh, that received events, maybe uh, let's say from the internet. Those events reached compute nodes uh, that did something and then generated payloads, sent them over through a load balancer, and then to a legacy Java service that sent them downstream. The Java service was concerned with all that uh, sending logic. Now, it is a legacy, like real legacy, ancient Java service. We didn't even have the code. It was that ancient. Um, but it worked. So while we didn't really like it, we didn't really have an incentive to replace it. It worked until the incident. Um, there were some issues downstream. Some of the nodes uh, returned errors and um, were misbehaving, but again, partial uh, outage there. And uh, the Java service had this logic somewhere. We don't really know what. Maybe it was an exponential back off uh, or a cooldown. But when it saw too many errors, uh, let's say over 25%, again, it's a guess, um, it stopped sending data. It just like shut itself down. And we lost one node and then the other until we basically lost the entire cluster and no events were reaching the downstream. Uh, that, as you might imagine, uh, was the final nail in the coffin for that service. We really wanted to kill it, so that was our, our excuse. Um, now that we understand that, let's see how we redesigned a new service. And when we go to redesign a service, we really need to understand what we're designing for. So first, this was a network-bound service. Um, everything was uh, coming from the network and out to the network. There was no disk or lots of state or a lot of compute, uh, mostly network, I.O. Um, we were striving for low latency, uh, less than 300 milliseconds, uh, SLO, just an objective. It's not an SLA. Uh, but again, it's a somewhat of a, of a commitment. Um, we had to design for high throughput. We had, at the time, 150 million events uh, daily. Um, and those weren't uniform. There were peaky bursts in the day, and we had to support the latency and the throughput. And of course, we're good engineers, right? We want to do something that's not over-engineered, it's slow in complexity. We can extend, we can maintain, we can understand later. Um, looking at those uh, throughput and latency metrics, we need to understand that, okay, we, we need to do something that does multitasking. And multitasking is simple, right? We have some tasks, we put them usually in a queue, and we run them. The naive way is sequentially, um, but you know it's not very scalable, so now. Uh, the usual way is to do this in parallel. Several worker threads, they consume tasks. Once they're done, they consume the next, and we're done. Much, much faster. But is this the fastest we can go? Let's look a deeper dive. When we look at IO tasks, uh, in this case an HTTP request, uh, we have several stages. First, we have the setup in which we set up headers, buffers, whatever we need. Then we kind of wait for a response to get from the, uh, the other endpoint. Uh, we send, it down the, send data down the socket and wait. Uh, lastly, we parse the response. The first part and the last part take some microseconds, right? It's very fast. It's almost negligible when you compare it to the milliseconds that we wait for those uh, responses to come back. And in that time, that, those milliseconds, we do nothing, really. We just kind of like sit idly and wait um, for data to come back. And when you really look at it, you see that for IO tasks, we spend over 99% of the time just waiting around, doing nothing. And if we look back at our multitasking, we see that because our tasks are what we call hollow, uh, lots of waiting, there's just, just 
big chunks of time when we do nothing. There's many tasks in flight, but nothing is getting done. So yeah, that might not be the optimal solution. Maybe there is an even better solution, more suitable solution. So again, we have some tasks, IO tasks, and uh, we put them in a queue. Uh, that's the concept here. We put them in the queue, and then that's what we want to do. We have a single thread here, and we are going to run consume tasks. And as we wait, we consume the next because we can do something in the meantime. So we kind of like interleave the tasks. We we wait and we and we and we run another tasks. And once we run all the tasks and we're just waiting, we can continue to wait until something gets back. In this case, the blue one got back, so we can finish it up. And uh, while we were completing that, the orange one did, so we can finish that up too. And so on and so on until they're all done. And time. Um, much faster um, than the uh, other sequential tasks and much more efficient than the parallel tasks because we did it in one thread. Uh, you can think of it kind of like juggling, right? We have tasks in flight, so we just wait. And we have balls um, that we have to like juggle and we can always process one of them, and when we are done, we throw it up in the air and process the next one. Uh, also, another benefit here is that we were single-threaded, so we didn't know synchronization primitives, no mutexes, no complicated stuff, just regular synchronous code. And that is the concept behind the event loop. Um, it's a conceptual diagram here. Uh, the actual implementation may differ because of OS level optimizations, but in general, the concept is largely the same. We have a task queue and a loop. And the loop does four things. First, it's the queue a task. Then it computes the task until it can compute it no more. And then it reaches stage three. We await. So those awaiting tasks go to this awaiting pool and we just kind of like pull them until something gets back and then it gets enqueued again. Uh, if there's nothing um, in the awaiting tasks that have like woken up, or nothing in the task queue, we just continue polling them both until something wakes up somewhere. Uh, the task queue may get added or modified um, from some other thread maybe. So that's possible uh, with Python. Um, that's the concept behind the async, uh, the async IO event loop, uh, what we call also non-blocking IO. And that's very nice in concept, but let's see how it really works. Let's see some code. Uh, so first we import async IO, right? That's our package from Python 3.0. Uh, three, I think, or Python 3.4, it's bundled with, uh, with the runtime. And you have this new uh, syntax, async and await, uh, from Python 3.6. Uh, this is async def, that means it's a task, what we call a coroutine. Um, a task for the loop, it has three parts. We print foo, then we await on async IO sleep, that means that we await on the loop. And then uh, once we wake up, after that one second, we print slash foo, that await part is very important because if you don't do it, you just kind of like create a task but not assign it to any loop. So don't forget the await. The next task, bar, is largely the same. It's, it prints bar and slash bar, but it has two sleeps. One is a time.sleep, which is the regular sleep that you already know. And the second one is the half a sleep on async IO. The first sleep is not interacting with the loop. It's just like any other code that would run synchronously, uh, a compute task that takes 300 milliseconds. To run both, uh, we have another core routine that's just here for boilerplate. Um, it does await on, on gather, and gather gathers foo and bar. So we put them both in the loop, and we async IO run main. That's how we start the loop. There is some lower level APIs if you need more control, but this does the job, and this code, if you paste it somewhere, will work. So we have the code on the left, we have the loop on the right, let's see what happens. So first, we await on the gather. Uh, also, we have a console on the, on the far right, uh, we'll see the prints in the console. So first, we gather, we put foo and bar in the task, in the task queue. And then the next thing that happens is with the queue, foo. So foo uh, goes out, uh, prints foo, uh, awaits for one second. That means it goes to the uh, orange rectangle there. Um, and what's the next thing that's going to happen? Right, bar is getting uh, dequeued, so we print bar. Uh, then we sleep for 300 milliseconds. We have Nothing to do here, we're just gonna like wait. Um, and then we await on async IO um, sleep. So bar goes to the awaiting queue task. 
who's gonna wake up first? Bar, right. After half a second, bar wakes up, gets enqueued, and there's nothing else in the queue. We take bar out, we uh, print slash bar, and we're done. And after how long will foo wake up? So 0 0.2 seconds. Why? Because we slept for 0 0.8 seconds and, and foo was uh, put for one second in time zero. So it's 0 0.2, that's the time we have left to wait. So after 0 0.2 uh, seconds, uh, foo will wake up and uh, gets enqueued, dequeued, and we are done. Uh, the whole process took around one second, plus you know some time for setup and printing and like neg negligible microseconds. Uh, and we can see the prints are foo bar and then slash bar slash foo. Uh, they're not in order because the tasks were interleaved, but each task was completed in its own scope. Um, and that's the magic behind async AO. Now that, now that we understand that, we can understand the solution. Um, right, so remember that, uh, and we need to replace this part, right? <laughs> um, so we have the load balancer, we have the downstream, and we have the service. First, the load balancer went away. We, uh, it made no sense, we put a distributed queue there. Uh, we read from the queue uh, with a consumer, and that consumer fed an event loop that sent data downstream. Now, if you remember, an event loop is a single-threaded construct. So it doesn't really utilize the, the, all the cores on the machine. For that, we did, we did something else. We, did, we, we put multiple event loops in place. Every uh, core ran its event loop. They all read from the same consumer and they both, uh, they all send it downstream. Um, how performant was this solution? Um, our old service had eight nodes, eight Java nodes, multi-threaded Java nodes that we were told were very lightweight and very fast and all that. Uh, and we were curious, how many, how many of these new service nodes are we gonna need on the other side to match that level of performance? Um, the, the surprising answer was one. One was fast enough to handle the entire Java cluster, uh, match the performance and even surpass it by a lot, basically. <laughs> um, so, you know, we killed that off, we took that out, um, we put the queue in, uh, we like the queue, and uh, we put a couple of these um, gateway 2.0 services uh, in production because again, this is production, uh, we need fault tolerance, we need high availability. Um, but one was enough, and they worked simultaneously. They were active, active. Um, everyone was very happy. <laughs> um, so now for the fun part, the learnings. What did we learn? It seems that async IO is a silver bullet. It will match all your multitasking needs. It's even better than the classic multi-threading or multi-processing, which is how you do really multi-threading uh, in Python because of the global interpreter lock. But what is it? Let's say we have so, some tasks, compute tasks. Um, here we parse a JSON, we open a file, we hash or we compute a model. Uh, the parse JSON, the hash, the compute model, they all take place in memory. There's no waiting there. There's no reads from disk or network or something. So there's no really time to interleave tasks. There's no idle time there. There's only work. Uh, for the open file one, it is uh, an IO task, yeah. Uh, but um, it, it uses the old API, right? An API that doesn't interact with event loops. So we need to have a variant that is able to interact with a loop. And if you run these tasks with async IO or try to inter interleave them, you'll just end up running them sequentially. Um, we only can use the time in which we do nothing to do things concurrently, uh, not parallel, concurrently. So back to our question, is it superior to multithreading? Nope. It isn't. Um, it's more of a tool. Like Miki said before, when asked about Go and Python, it's a tool. Yeah, async.io is a tool, multithreading is a tool, everything is a tool. Um, it's a very useful one. If you had a toolbox that had a hammer and a screwdriver, you are, now you also have a drill. You can do new stuff, but it doesn't, doesn't replace the hammer. All right, so we know that it's a new tool, but once you go multitasking, do you just choose to use concurrency and that's it. Uh, we saw that we didn't use just concurrency. We used both concurrency and parallelism in conjunction because they were able to complement each other. So if you use that tool, it doesn't mean you don't have to use the others. It just um, 
something that can run in the context of other uh, paradigms that you already have. Given those learnings, we were able to upgrade our entire ecosystem. There were other components uh, before that you didn't see in the diagram because we just kept it simple. Um, but generally, we built the other components using async I.O. and multitasking and, and all that. Um, even the compute nodes, uh, they were more parallel than async, but they still had it. Um, and the system reached a state on the same hardware that processed over a billion daily events. It grew very much um, without really breaking a sweat. So this was extremely effective. Um, yeah, my main takeaway from this is that, you know, be curious, analyze your systems, see if there's anything you can uh, tinker with or use uh, new paradigms with. Once you do, experiment, do some exper experimentation, try some packages, um, see if you like what you see, your results. And if you do like it, integrate it into your daily lives, into your toolbox. Um, it's a great tool to have, super useful, and uh, we sure had a lot, of, a lot of fun with it. That is it. I hope that if you didn't uh, know Async.io, you now do. If you knew, you learned something new. And if you didn't, uh, you still enjoyed the story. Thank you very much. My name is Asaf. This is my LinkedIn. If you, wanna have, if you have any feedback, want to ask questions, discuss, feel free to, and we have some time for questions. Yeah. Oh, great question. When we would want to use multi-threading instead of async.io. Uh, if you remember, we had uh, some compute tasks that we showed before, and async.io doesn't really give you any benefit when you use it in that context, because you don't have any place to interleave. There's no idle time. So if you're heavy on compute, parallel computing is pretty much your way to go here. Um, also, if your API is a legacy API that doesn't use async.io and you don't have the time to refactor it or the reason to, um, it might be better to just stick with the old method. But if you redesign the system, you might want to integrate async.io in it. I hope that answers the question. Great. Anyone else? Yeah. Luckily, um, that's okay. I will repeat the question. How did we handle um, libraries that didn't support async.io uh, when we built the system? Um, right. So. The good news is that now most libraries, async li like I.O. libraries for databases or connectors and all that, if it's Redis or whatever, have an async I.O. variant, so you can use that. Uh, in our case, we were lucky enough to not be blocked by any uh, legacy libraries that didn't support. Uh, we didn't use a lot of, um, like it was mainly, mainly network, so network was uh, supported. The consumer at the time did not support async I.O., so this, the, this, the consumer was synchronous and it fed the event loop with, with the queue. So it was another process that fed uh, that, that async I.O. thread. I hope that answers the question. Great. Thank you very much.